everybody. I've been fighting with my little friend here. He's very shy. His name is Rob. He's probably just going to sit there for now. It's kind of funny that Rob is so shy. I was really shy when I was a little child, 10 years ago, as I'm so young today. <laughs> Oh, anything, any big challenge used to drive me bananas and probably drove my parents bananas too. I wanted to be in nice, tidy, little boxes. Things were drawn out for me. I wanted a career that had a title. People knew exactly what I was doing. It was very safe. And I never felt lost. Um, and then it's kind of funny because as I grew older, I came to embrace challenges a little bit more. And, you know, those safe routes are very useful. They help you gain discipline and rigor. But when you can start moving away from them and doing things very differently, you end up with much more excitement. So as it turns out today, I really like challenges. And I'm going to talk to you about a bit of those different challenges that I engage with. Um, here's something that I like to do. It's a little kooky. It is... I love to race in triathlons. Most of you get a sense of what that is. That's when you and a whole bunch of people put on a lot of tight black rubber, jump in water, get flailed at, wear a nice shiny cap, and then of course, uh, you get on a bike and then you can cycle for hours and then you finish off with a nice run. Huh? Who wouldn't want to do that? It's so much fun. And you know what's worse is I pay to go and do this. My mom thinks it's absolutely bananas. She is most likely worried that something's going to happen to me, which is probably why I was a very nervous child to begin with. So the thing I love about triathlons is that very, very few people on this planet are good at all of those three disciplines. It's a humbling activity, right? First of all, you don't dress in the best of outfits when you do this. And then, of course, you're sweaty. Things can happen. It's messy. But it's a lot of fun because it's a push, push, push. And because it's a challenge, you always have something to work towards. And I think that that is really what generates for me the great fun in that. So now we wonder, what the heck does triathlon have to do with robotics, for example? So I'm going to take a few seconds and introduce my friend properly this time. This is Rob. Rob is a now robot, and he's manufactured um, by Aldebaran Robotics. And he's cute, and he's cuddly. Um, at times, he, he can be uh, stubborn as well. And with Rob, we do something super exciting together. I have a nice team of people that come from a whole bunch of different disciplines, and we go into centers where there are children with autism spectrum disorder. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it is primarily a social communicative disorder. And it is a reality of our world. Children have autism spectrum disorder. And what I can do with my little friend Rob and his brother Max is go into these centers and spend some time with children, watching them interact with Rob. And what I get from that is a whole bunch of information about how these children speak. And when I go into these centers, I don't make any promises. I don't say I have a cure for anything. I don't come in with big grant money. I just ask, hey, this is my interest. I like this. I think that there's a genuine need for us to uncover more. And guess what happens? People say yes. And this is what I really want to talk to you about today. And you can understand that there could be some skepticism, right? What would a person with a PhD in French studies and a master's in collaborative semiotics have anything to do with robotics, programming, computer engineering, um, autism spectrum disorder, therapeutic um, programs for children, and so on and so forth. Well, if we lived in a world where there were nice, safe, tidy little boxes, that would be a really big problem. And as it turns out, we don't really have those. And the more you can embrace and allow yourself to step just outside of the particular rules of a discipline, you end up engaging in a lot. So being an interdisciplinarian is what I do. It's not that nice, clean, tidy line that I had hoped for as a child. But I can tell you that it's something that I'm very proud of. So, in triathlon, there is a lot of pain. It's really uncomfortable sometimes. You have to ask yourself, oh gosh, why am I up at 6 a.m. doing this again? And, and, of course, you look at other people who are faster, 
better, they're stronger, they've raced more, they look better in neoprene, you know? There's a lot of this stuff that's going on and it's always a big challenge and yet you have to go back. And the reason for that is that when you push yourself well beyond your comfort zone, you develop humility. And in this world where we are often told to win, 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 humility seems to be second or third or fourth or maybe not at all on your list. And the reality there is when you allow yourself to be around people who have gifts and energy and knowledge that you might just never have at the tip of your fingertips like, you, that, like they do, you end up being a student of everything. And by being around people like that, you realize that you too, you're in the race, you're with them. You might not be leading, but you're there and you're watching them and you're gaining from their experience and they are really showing you something quite unique. And if anything else, knowing that you don't have to come first every single time to make a difference in your own life and that of other people has its merit as well. So this research that I do, it, as I said, is just, it's growing, it's slow, People are interested because there's a robot, but I'm no robotician. In fact, when he malfunctions, I tend to cry because I have no idea what's going on. But because of that, I just surround myself with experts, people with genuine skills. People without these kinds of projects might not ever work with children with autism spectrum disorder. In fact, the kind of team I need requires multiple expertise. But at the same time, they have to come together. There's no point in having people identifying their silo and then staying in it. They have to understand, look, when you create this program, it's going to play out like this, and a child is going to receive it like this. And then I want you to also understand what that means in larger linguistic practices, for example. So for them, being part of the full team and really being involved is what's super important. And I think now we have a slide a blurry slide, because this is usually what it looks like when you're racing. Sweats in your eyes. You're in a delirious state. It's a lot of fun. Really, we can talk about triathlon some more if you want to. So I have this great opportunity to do research well outside of my curated fields. I can gain new expertise without necessarily becoming the best, number one. I have this lovely opportunity to work with students from a whole bunch of different backgrounds too. And at the same time, I keep repeating to myself that all of this is for a greater good. But as I work in that larger question of what is autism and how could human-robot interaction ever provide any insight into it, I'm reminded that it impacts people, but at the same time, those who are participating with me are being impacted by the genuine interest of working together and not feeling like it's a race. And I think that that is probably one of the most important discoveries I have had so far. So when you get into a triathlon, you arrive at your station and you have to rack your bike and then usually you have to, have you and six friends get you into a wetsuit and then you wait panicked at the start of the swim start and then you have to find your way back to that bike, and it is an orderly, disorderly mess. There is practice in place. Things are supposed to run a certain way, but along that race, things happen that you have no control over. And what I've discovered in my research, like I have in triathlon, except for it doesn't hurt as much when it's in research, is that those accidents, those mishaps, those lost steps, they provide you with the greatest teaching opportunities. So you forgot something. So what do you do to make up for it? Well, you create, you invent, you listen to your teammates. You try and figure out, you know, why that mistake would have happened in the first place. And then you adjust. And that kind of group thinking and effort to make something work regardless of circumstances builds on that humility. It genu generates genuine creativity and it makes you very tolerant and empathetic and respectful of the kinds of things that do happen in the real world. Research can't always be in a perfectly constrained environment where the variables and invariables are known ahead of time. That doesn't make for very interesting discoveries. 
letting yourself be completely blown out of the water or lost by the leaders means that you have to play catch up and you have to do so with creative thinking. And the other thing is, is when you always work with other experts, you're always learning. And I said that just a few moments ago, and it's really true. You do always learn. There's never a stalemate. You always engage. And when I mean experts, I'm just not talking about those with six PhDs and a crown. Well, no, I don't know who wears crowns or who has six PhDs. But the students with whom I work, they're the best guides. They're the ones who are just slowly getting going in their own research areas, but they're still willing to hear what everybody else has to say. And believe it or not, the best students make the best teachers because they remember and they act at the same time what it's like to receive and then what that should look like when you give back. In triathlon, there's a lot of things that we can and can't do. There's a whole bunch of rules. And this is where there's a split. Interdisciplinarity doesn't combine just three things. It can combine 12, 20, 30, and as many people as you would like. Triathlons, regardless of what we say, is three sports. And they happen in succession. And then they put stops. You can't draft in cycling. For those of you who don't know what drafting is, that's when you hang on the back wheel of somebody else. They break the wind for you, uh, as in breaking the wind in front of you. And then you hold on to that back wheel, and you can get a lot of more momentum without putting out as much energy. It's a great thing. In races, they don't let you do that, because then you're using up somebody else's energy to win. In research, where there's interdisciplinarity, you draft all the time. You just find that expert, hang on to their back wheel, and follow. Because they've got something for you. And then when it's your turn, you hop on the front, and then you pull. And you let them ride on your coattails. And it's this give and take, give and take, and you save so much energy. If I had to go back and learn everything I could about robotics and programming just to get my project underway, I would still be in some darkened corner library covered in dust and crying. I do tend, I don't cry that much, but I like to say that I do. This makes me more humane. Um, so all of this is really, really neat because it forces us to work collaboratively and to remember the strengths of others. And that sometimes recognizing those strengths in other people means that we don't have to have them ourselves, that we can profit from the gains of others. And this is true collaboration. And when you really do interdisciplinary learning, that's what happens across the board. Everybody gains from that collaboration. And something new is developed. In my research, I work with students from electrical engineering and programming in design in um, social work, in philosophy, in music, and they all participate. And if there's anything that I can leave you with is that notion. Even if you have the luck to become the expert in your field, find somebody completely antipodal to yourself and share that with them. I wish for all of you electrical engineers to spend an afternoon creating with a music philosopher and for everybody in architecture to find someone in dance and just make something new, even if it's just sharing your perspectives. And if there's something that I can take with me everywhere I go, even if I don't uncover any special linguistic phenotype in children by way of these human-robot interactions, or something happens and I can't keep on with my research the way I hope to, I will have really discovered something super important. And that's just being in a space with a child who has autism spectrum disorder, who for the first time, maybe because I had something to do with it, maybe because I had nothing to do with it, but them turning to their therapist and vocalizing for the first time, I love you. That will happen enough. And for those of you who have that opportunity to work with children, to work with other people in new circumstances, whatever they may be, just the chance to see something happen for the first time. You don't win a prize, you're not first at crossing that line, but you are a winner in my books. And on a last note, as a French citizen, I would like to say, à mes compatriotes français, je vous aime. Thank you very much.